Super Rugby in New Zealand, what's wrong? Why don't people get out and sell out every single game? It's a good question. And this video is kind of the byproduct of some of the, the questions I got in a previous video I did about Super Rugby's attendance. If you haven't seen that one, go and check that one out. Um, it raised some questions about, especially the game here in New Zealand, which I'm obviously most familiar with being here in New Zealand. And um, yeah, some questions I couldn't quite answer directly i don't think there was any one particular reason i think it's probably a bit of a multi-faceted thing but let's go through a few of those points some of them were uh, were mentioned by other commenters as well so um yeah we'll go through some of these points and you guys can let me know your thoughts so obviously the new zealand games don't sell out week to week and that is kind of a curious one uh, rugby union is our national game here in new zealand we've got five super rugby teams why don't they why don't they sell well because our team's records you can't really fault them on the records apart from my blues who over the last 10 years have been pretty poor the other new zealand teams have all at least won one title i think the crusaders have got three chiefs have got two and the other couple the hurricanes and the highlanders have got one each and generally they're making the playoffs pretty much every year so there's not really any particular reason in terms of the teams underperforming uh, with the Blues being an exception, so why don't they sell out? Uh, I know Eden Park, maybe 50,000 people to a Super Rugby game is a bit too ambitious, but why don't they get 30 or 20? Why is it like kind of 10,000 people uh, per game? Why is it 15 at the others? You know, Why isn't it 20,000 for a Super Rugby game? As I said, it's our national game. So there's a few things I'll look at. And um, as I said, you guys can let me know your thoughts on which one or which ones you think are kind of the most prevalent. So the first one, given that we, we know the New Zealand teams have got a pretty good record, the match day experience. And it's something I've given feedback on to the Blues anyway, because I've been a season ticket holder with the Blues for a few years. And at the end of the season, they send you an email and say, hey, fill out this survey. Tell us what did you like? What did you not like about, about being a Blues member? Um, and I would always give them a bit of grief about the match they experience, about how it was a bit quiet, it's a bit boring, they like to, to kind of flood the air with, with music, there's not really much of an atmosphere, the crowd doesn't really get into the game, and I had some suggestions, uh, whether or not they would work in a New Zealand context, I don't know, like generally I don't think New Zealand fans are as vocal as maybe some other countries. But yeah, generally it's pretty quiet. Also, the food and the drink is pretty expensive and maybe not the best quality. You don't have a whole lot of choices in terms of your drinks. I'm not sure what the other Super Rugby clubs are like. I think the Hurricanes introduced like cheap craft beer this season. But for the most part, the beer is expensive and the food is expensive. It's not the best quality and it takes a bloody long time to stand in the queue to get the stuff. So that combined with the ticket prices, which... I don't think they're like exorbitantly expensive. Like I think 25 bucks is what will get you into a blues game for like the cheapest tickets, maybe up to about 50, 60 bucks. But if you're looking at a family or, you know, a couple of adults, a few beers and some chips and whatnot, yeah, it can be a pretty expensive evening. You get into the hundreds of dollars. So average salary, I think in Auckland's like $66,000 when I Googled it. So if you were going to do that eight times a season, you know, it, it could add up to a fair bit when you know you you could be spending that money on other things so um yeah ticket prices also eden park again i'm speaking largely because eden park is is uh, my home ground here i'm not sure all the other stadiums are like there's no parking at eden park you you can't just rock on up and you can't park at the stadium that that's not a thing you have to park miles away if you're driving because essentially all the roads around eden park it's in a suburban neighborhood they um they they put signs up saying you can't park here during uh, during game day. It's a tow away area, so you've got to park even further away and walk through. I guess because the residents in that neighborhood don't want all these people parking outside their houses and maybe taking up parking spots where residents would normally park. So there's no parking. You got to walk. You can take the train or the bus, but like for me, from my neighborhood, there's no bus to Eden Park. I would have to like bus and then transfer to another bus. I think some of the buses and trains are free with your match ticket, but again, 
it's not um it's not the best one. So public transport for Auckland's another thing. I'm not sure. I think when I went to the Crusader Stadium, there did seem to be some parking. Uh, for the one in Wellington, I don't know that there's parking. And uh, likewise, when I went to the one in Dunedin, there was a lot of people on foot. So, yeah. They don't make it that easy or that rewarding to actually go to the game. Now, the fact that the game time is on at 7 o'clock or 7.30 is what it used to be, I think is mostly for the TV deal. Because that means people in South Africa can watch the game in the fairly early morning. Likewise, people in Europe. Um, if you want... And they do seem to be targeting the game towards families. If you want families to go, it probably needs to be in the afternoon. There's no way I'm taking my four-year-old to a game at 7 o'clock, man. I'm not going to get home. Again, walking from the car to the stadium and then back to the car on the way home. He's not going to get home to 9, 30, 10 o'clock. So, yeah, that's not going to happen. So, if you're going to get families to the game which seems to be the audience they're targeting um then yeah the game needs to be earlier but with the tv deal i don't think that's going to happen so those are probably a few things i think which don't exactly draw people in to going to the games again that's largely biased towards my experiences here in auckland but i think some of those are probably applicable to other grounds around new zealand as well um lack of connection to the team this one i hadn't thought about it as much but i saw a few people mention this kind of thing in the comments and the more i dwelled on it i think it does kind of make sense so and i'll probably seem like a bit of an old man when i go through some of the stuff but when i was a young fella there wasn't super rugby there were only your local provincial teams so auckland you know north harbour which is the north of auckland northland these three teams are all separate teams. Under Super Rugby, they all come under the one umbrella. Uh, likewise, you know, different regions around the other areas of New Zealand make up the other Super Rugby teams as well. And I'm not sure that it's one that everybody buys into, especially given the fact that players kind of move around freely. Like, I seem to remember, and I could be mistaken, but the, the great Auckland teams when I was a kid... Most of the players were either from Auckland or they went to school in Auckland. They had a pretty clear connection to Auckland. They didn't move around. You felt like it was a genuine Auckland team when they named an all-black squad. There was debate about how many Aucklanders were in the squad, how many Cantabrians, how many Wellingtonians and whatnot. It doesn't really happen anymore. There's not really a defined, like, you play for the team where you grow up. You basically just play for whoever signed you. Uh, there's not really such a connection like Damien McKenzie's from Southland. He plays for for the Chiefs. Lord knows how many guys from Auckland have gone on to be successful in other franchises like Kieran Reed's from the very south of Auckland or at least the north of the Waikato. But he played for the Crusaders. So yeah, there doesn't seem to be as much of a connection for the players. And it may not be a huge factor, but it probably does disconnect some people from the teams as well. Like especially... If you're from Northland, and I've met people from Northland who don't support the Blues. Northland is the area, like, north of Auckland. They're technically in the Blues region, but they probably hate Auckland, I would imagine. Like, people from Auckland go on holidays up there. They probably get sick of the sight of us Aucklanders coming up there. Uh, when we traditionally played each other, we're rivals. The fact that they're now expected to support the team playing from the heart of Auckland doesn't seem to... I guess compute with them and I know a lot of people well not a lot of people but I've met a few people from Northland who will basically you know, support the Chiefs or they'll support the Canes they don't support the Blues so there's not that much of a buy-in with the team so I mean when I was a kid like I mentioned the the players would come around and do do stuff with the schools you genuinely felt a connection to the team you were proud to be supportive of the team that you followed and you genuinely had a bit of dislike for the opponents. Like there's a famous photo uh, from New Zealand rugby history with some kid in Canterbury who's got a sign that says like, I hate you Auckland or something like that. And it was a bit of a controversial one at the time. But that kind of tribalism I think is healthy for the game. You look at sports like the UFC, you got the likes of Conor McGregor, uh, you know, with that Mayweather fight. All they did was talk smack to each other for ages because, you know, they were trying to generate some interest in the fight uh, i don't follow boxing or, or ufc that much but you know guys like mcgregor and tyson fury attract casual fans because they make that kind of 
tribal thing interesting but you don't really have that because there's not the connections between the players and the teams or you know maybe the regions and whatnot yeah i think that that kind of has been lost over time so um yeah from my childhood i remember going to games where fans would like yell at each other my dad was one of the worst he would yell at the opponent uh the opposing fans he would yell at their players, he would yell at the ref, and he was really, I mean, as I got to be a teenager, he was pretty embarrassing. Uh, I just wanted to kind of crawl into my shell. Um, but yeah, other guys would yell back at him, and it was a good bit of banter, and it was enjoyable. It added a bit of spice to the game. I don't really see it happening much anymore. Everyone's pretty quiet. Again, it goes to the match day atmosphere, but that lack of tribalism, I think, maybe has taken away a bit of that, that connection players... Uh, fans have to the players and to the team so yeah that's potentially another factor the competition as a whole this might be a big one um there's probably been a few things which have disconnected fans from the competition as a whole how much new zealand fans care about what goes on in south africa and, and australia or argentina and japan in recent years i mean i'm not sure how much that would have changed over the years but I feel like I used to, I mean, again, it's all anecdotal, but I feel like people used to stay up to watch their team when they would go to South Africa more than they, they do now. It, it seems like kind of an exception rather than the rule. And I would say the competition as a whole has maybe suffered a bit through the expansion, all the rule changes, the conference system. The conference system is probably a big one, which New Zealand fans especially didn't like I know South Africans have got their own issues with um, the way the comp is set up in terms of them having to do a lot more like on the road stuff than than the Kiwis and the Aussies and there's some fair points to that but from the New Zealand narrative it's the conference system is unfair because often one of the New Zealand teams is actually the second highest team on points but still finishes like fourth below the other two conference winners the South African team and the Australian team who win in the top of their conferences. Um, that year with the Hurricanes, I think, finished below the Brumbies. That was like the, the example one. But that's that's the thing that gets talked about a fair bit here in New Zealand. Remember, this is purely from a New Zealand point of view. So I think that's probably disengaged people a bit. You could say it's too complicated. I don't know that it's that complicated, but definitely returning to a round robin. I think is uh, is going to simplify things for people a bit. But if you've lost them, you, you may not just get them back because of that fact. Again, it's probably one factor, I think. And then again, tinkering with the amount of teams and whatnot, too many lopsided matches hasn't helped things either. On top of that, you get the fact that New Zealand rugby pretty openly devalues the competition by ensuring that all blacks at certain times play limited super rugby games. So they can keep them fresh for the All Blacks. That's directly sending a message. This competition doesn't matter as much as something else. Which can't be good for the game. I mean, in New Zealand, and as I said, like our teams are successful. For the most part, the top players all remain in New Zealand. They sometimes do sabbaticals and sometimes they do, uh, you know, this rotating in and out. But unlike, you know, some of the other countries... The majority of our top players are still here. It's often the fringe ones who go abroad. But the fact that New Zealand rugby says they need to rest a certain amount of games, even if it's a really important game coming up, the coaches have to manage that. And it sends a message to the fans that the game you really want to watch is the All Blacks one. You don't really need to watch the Super Rugby ones unless you're kind of a diehard fan, which seems to be the way uh, the game uh, is going. So... Um, yeah, the conference system, New Zealand rugby's message, it just seems to be a second tier tournament and that, that I think has gotten to people's psyche. Now, all of this may honestly not matter when you consider the fact that 2020, 2019 or whatnot, is, it's just a different period of time from, from 20 years ago. People have got a lot more options now in terms of their entertainment man they got netflix at home they got a 50 inch tv they've got you know a much a much clearer picture of the game on their you know high definition feed there's not as much incentive to actually go and watch the game yourself 
you may not even want to watch the game. You might want to watch Netflix. Like I said, you may want to play video games. There's a whole bunch of other stuff you could be doing instead of caring about the rugby. And maybe rugby is just not competing. They are not making the game, uh, at this level anyway, attractive enough, again, to, to draw in people who aren't kind of the diehard fans. So, yeah, I think there's, I mean, the fact that, like, for example, Super Rugby is behind a paywall here in New Zealand. you got to pay Sky TV to get access to Super Rugby. And if I want to go to the game, I still have to pay for my game ticket. So why would I pay Sky to, to watch the game at home and then pay again to watch the game live? You know what I mean? I can quite easily justify sitting at home, watching it on my HD TV rather than going to the game. If it's raining, I'm not going to get wet. I don't have to worry about the transport, the walk to the park. I've got a clear picture. I've got cheap beers at home, better food. Bathroom is right there, no queues. There's a lot more convenient reasons to stay at home. And I may not even watch the game. If I'm a casual fan, I might think something else on telly. In, you know, 2000 or whatever it was, you maybe didn't have on-demand viewing. You might have looked at the... On your standard def definition TV, you might have looked at what was on TV and gone, oh, I'm not watching any of that, I'll go to the game. Nowadays, you can watch what you watch, want to watch when you want to watch it. And... Uh, yeah, it's just not as good. So, um, yeah, there's uh, a lot of other things going on in the world. People might just want to be on social media instead of um, going to a rugby game. Lastly, it also could be a sign of the times and just that generally, for the men's game anyway, participation is dropping. There are fewer schoolboy teams, fewer schoolboy players, fewer club players, fewer grassroots players. That's just a thing. The women's game is growing. The men's game, for the most part, is shrinking. Other sports, and again, other forms of entertainment, uh, like the NBA and whatnot, basketball, and especially in New Zealand, is one of the sports that's kind of taking off. Uh, ever since we've had one guy get into the NBA and earn a ton more than probably our top 20 rugby players earn combined, um, that's probably a lot more attractive for some of the young guys. The marketing in those games is a lot better than what rugby does and um yeah so it could just be a sign of the times i might have to do another video at some point on some suggestions on what rugby could do to to alleviate some of these problems but here are and i know it's a bit of a ranty one i'm almost gone 18 minutes but here are a few reasons that potentially kiwis don't get out to watch the game we're not that big a country there's generally not that much going on compared to some bigger parts of the world, but we still can't get out there to watch um, to watch our, our top level rugby comp, which is not the internationals. Internationals, as I did in another video, we sell them out. Super rugby level, kind of far from it. But yeah, what else is there? I'm sure there's other factors that I've missed. These are just a few that um that i thought of and some of them are kind of adapted from what other people mentioned in the comments and i see some validity too you guys let me know your thoughts and um yeah i'll talk to you again soon cheers guys